morning, it's uh, Tuesday, June 21st, 2011, and the weatherman said it's going to be a uh, fantastic day. A bit cool on the other side at the moment, but uh, the, weather, the weatherman says uh, as the day unfolds, it's going to rise. The temperature is going to rise into the 80s, the sort of uh, conditions we have been used to in the tropics. It's going to be a wonderful day. And like the weather, the jazz is going to stay on the bowl and keep you enlightened with a packed program for you this morning on the Spice Morning. Uh, we're going to talk uh, the tax situation in Grenada, that and public entertainment and also the property tax. Uh, Janelle uh, Chanel Andrew, the PRO in the Inland Revenue Department, will be in to let us in on the action as concerns that area. Also this morning, we look at the Economic Partnership Agreement, the EPA. Mr. Uh, let's see, Mr. Desmond John, the EPA Implementation Officer right here in the spy cell, will be telling us all about the EPA that was signed in 2008 and the sort of benefits Grenada can derive from being in that arrangement. Uh, also this morning we look at um, protocol, policy and research division of the foreign affairs. We speak to the protocol officer later on, Ms. Alice Roberts and also Ms. Roxy Hudson who is the Foreign Service Officer in that ministry. Later on, we lower the curtains when we look at, uh, we highlight the various areas of work within the Ministry of Health. We talk to three officials, Andrew Worm, the Environment the Chief Environmental Officer, uh, the Acting Permanent Secretary, Mr. Andrew, Mr. Clement Gabriel, and of course, the uh, Community Nurse, uh, Lydia Francis. Uh, these and much more are all featured in this edition of the Spice Morning for Tuesday, June the 21st. Don't you move the dial because the GIS, uh, we've got to call for the next 90 minutes right here. rolling and um, uh, I'm gonna say good morning to Mr. Desmond John and you know Desmond um, being one who was um, very much part of the revolution you know I learned to learn so much thing from the revolution one thing I learned uh, very much being punctual punctuality so important and been up here quite early and um, you were before me <laughs> before <laughs> that day before me. <laughs> so you're a punctual guy always on time I, I believe in being on time. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So much, so many good, good things can happen. Indeed, the whole up indeed. events, you let things flow. Exactly, exactly. Right. So you beat me today this morning. Yes. Probably had some um, revolutionary traits too. Mm, no. Right, um, Desmond, uh, the EPA, uh, you are the EPA implementation officer or coordinator right here in the spy cell i've been hearing lots of uh, talk about the epa uh, it was signed in 2008 and um just what is the epa thank you trevor and good morning to our listeners um the epa is of course the economic partnership agreement it's essentially a trade and development agreement between the european union and the CARI Forum. The CARI Forum meaning the Caribbean Forum of ACP states. CARICOM plus Dominican Republic. What the EPA basically does in a, in a, in a nutshell is provides a framework for development cooperation between the EU and the CARI Forum. And the, the backbone of it addresses the issue of trade liberalization. So it's essentially a trade liberalization agreement, but with a development component. <coughs> um, you got to speak more about that. You got to, to explain a little more about, about right. this. <laughs> OK. Um, <coughs> the, for example, the, the objectives of the agreement, some of the major objectives, are one, to 
integrate uh, the Caribbean economy or the Cariforum economy into the world economy to alleviate poverty, to improve capacity within Cariforum in trade matters, trade and trade negotiation matters. Um, these are some of the major objectives of, of the EPA. As you know, there is a number of provisions um, and a number of titles. Essentially, you have <coughs> provisions that deal with trade in goods. Yes? Um, then you have provisions that deal with trade in services, trading services, investment, and e-commerce. You have what is called a cultural protocol, which addresses issues of culture. And we can touch on those uh, afterwards. Then we have the development cooperation provisions where the, 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 the agreement, well, not the agreement so much as the EDF will provide resources for the region under a regional program, under the 10 TDF, to support the implementation of the EPA. So, for example, there's 72 million euros under the 10 EDF directed to supporting regional interventions, yes, to implement provisions of the EPA. Now, most of the work that has to be done is to ensure that our regulatory mechanisms are in place. We have to remove all barriers to trade, both trade in goods and trade in services. Yeah? Um, in so doing, Government will have to review a significant amount of legislation based on what, what, what's defined specifically as obligations in the <coughs> agreement. Now, there has to be modifications or amendments to any legislation that will be restrictive to trade. Yes? So that's one piece of work that, that has to be done. Another very important piece of work that has to be done is the whole question of public education. The public education element of the implementation of the EPA is critical. The reason being that there has been a lot of discussions and sentiments, so to speak, as to whether the EPA was good for the region <coughs> or whether it was not good for the region. But the, the main point is this, that we now have an EPA, an EPA that the region has signed on to. So what we have to do as a people and as a region is to see how much we can benefit from the EPA. Now, what are the main benefits that we can derive from the EPA? The main benefits that we can derive is through the market access opportunities. Under the EPA, the Europeans allows us duty-free, quota-free access to their markets in a number of areas, both in terms of goods and in terms of services. <coughs> All right? Now, the question is, whilst there's access, it does not mean that we automatically, automatically can walk into the European market. No. We will require to satisfy a number of conditions. In the case of goods, we have to ensure that the goods that we export meets the required standards of the European market. Similarly, the services that we would want to export to the, United, to the European market will have to meet the required standards, for example, and I'll take that example because it, it may be one that everybody can relate to. Under the EPA, we have the cultural protocol, and there are significant opportunities in, 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 in entertainment services. In our entertainment services, who, who do we have? We have musicians, we have calypsonians, music, yeah? The art form, as we say. Now, we can't, we can't send our artists, we can't export them to European markets if they are not certified. 
if they're not registered. All right? So they have to be registered. And they have to be accredited. Now, if they are registered and accredited, it means that they can move to the European market. They can have, <coughs> you know, uh, joint ventures and sing with other people and stuff like that. So they can sell their services, notwithstanding there is the access there, but it's getting in. So therefore, what we will have to do if we want to build our, our, our the capacity of, of, of our entertainers, we will have to get them registered. We will but have to get them accredited. <coughs> Right, we understand all of that. Uh, you talk about market access and uh, building capacity, and you talk earlier on about the uh, 72 million euros put aside to help, um, you know, Irritate. lesser developed countries build their economies so that they can, you know, be more productive and export uh, more goods. But what is happening in this area? What sort of support uh, are countries getting or? Uh, since 2008, what can you tell me has transpired in terms of, um, you know, smaller, the lesser developed countries getting the sort of support to, to boost the economy so that they can become more competitive and um, have a, the EP arrangement could be a little more, you know, binding, equality as it were. Okay. Um, what has happened is that the implementation mechanisms have been slow in, 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 in coming forward. For example, in the CARICOM Secretariat, which is a regional hub, so to speak, for EPA implementation, the EPA implementation office only came on stream in 2009. In 2009. Now, in Grenada, there was what I want to call an, an, an EPA implementation initiative. But the EPA implementation office was fully staffed only on April 15th of this year. So, so we have been formally existing for just what? Just about two months and a week. That's nine weeks. That tells you one thing, Trevor. It tells you that not very much has been done. All right? Not very much has been done at the regional level, nor at the national level. But let me make this, this point. The, 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 there is a, what is called an EPA roadmap, which has been prepared by the CARICOM Secretariat. Now, the EPA roadmap spells all the activities that member states and the region should implement. Therefore, if the regional unit is slow, it affects the ability of the national governments to proceed. Because you can't just jump ahead of the regional unit. You have to work with the region. It's a regional agreement at the end of the day. And the guidance and so forth must come from the region. What we have now is an EPA implementation unit which I had. We have two staff. We intend to get a legal officer soon. And what we have done so far is to have had consultation with a number of stakeholders. We intend later on to have very specific theme consultations. What we had was just very focused consultations, basically targeting organizations like the Chamber of Industry and Commerce, the not the Manufacturers, the, the Employers Federation, the Greater um, Coalition of Service Industries, the Ministry of Tourism, the Board of Tourism, Legal Affairs, a number of key stakeholders <coughs> to get them on board. But after that, we'll be going to target a much wider constituency. Mm -hmm. All right? And we'll be having specific theme focus interventions. Right. So from where you sit, um, have you taken a look at, at the, the sort of um, products, the sort of areas that um, that support can can really make a difference, can make an impact. The exactly. area that we would need to, to focus our attention. Yes, yes. In fact, our initial discussion with those key stakeholders indicated to us some of the areas that they have needs. Mm -hmm. All right? But in addition to that, 
we we have identified some areas in collaboration with the regional EPA implementation unit. Um, those areas you have those those areas identified. We have identified for 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 what we call urgent action because there's a six month window where we need to spend some funds. The region needs to spend some funds. And we have identified the areas of culture. Mm -hmm. um, we propose financial services regulation. Mm -hmm. We also suppose, propose institutional strengthening of the Grenada uh, Coalition of Service Providers, service industries. The reason being that it becomes very important as they are very critical to moving the services agenda forward. And just to say this, uh, Trevor, the LDCs, if you want to use that terminology, are concentrating on trading services because we don't really have goods to export. Our opportunities do not lie in goods. Our opportunities lie in services. So our concentration are on the provisions that deal with trading services. Is there nowhere, um, agriculture for example, um, you know, we got the land and uh, we do produce some products um, in terms of uh, expansion, expanding production. There's a possibility. Yes, there. yes. I'm thinking so. Yeah, we are not saying that we should not, um, we should forget the opportunity for trading goods. No. We have to take up that opportunity as well. Because what so we're seeing, seeing so many goods coming in. And we're not, you know, we're not responding. We're not sending <laughs> goods out, you know. Yeah, correct. But what what <coughs> what we're talking about uh, here is looking to say we can extract the greatest advantage. L let me give you a simple example. One, we know that we do not produce a high quantity of goods. We don't. What we can do, we can do niche marketing. For example. We have our diaspora in, in, in the UK and, and, and in other European countries. We can target our agricultural production to the diaspora. But there are other areas that we have some advantage. For example, in the cocoa industry, you know we have one of the best chocolates in the world. I would think we have advantage to in nutmegs. Right? Nutmegs. And there's great opportunity in nutmegs. But those opportunities will come if we partner, for example, with European firms to do the research and development. As you know, Trevor, nutmeg is used in the pharmaceutical industry, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the beauty industry, in food, in all kinds of things. I remember Mr. Mr. Brezan giving a whole, you know, exclusive right. production as to the, the trimeristin and all different kinds right. of things so many things and and that's a years you know but years and years and we're just not taking those advices and running with it what I mean what, <laughs> what you see what it would require is significant investment in research and development we have been saying no, that this is 21st century we don't have the money and that is why for us to have this significant investment in research and development we have to partner now the EPA gives us that opportunity to partner with European companies to develop the industry. If we do that, then we have a good opportunity now to, 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 to improve and to increase our production of value added. We're not talking about selling nothing in Crocus Bag anymore. Of course. We're talking about value added high end products. But those require significant investment. Mm -hmm. Do we have the money to do it? GCN will have to tell us that. But I don't think we have it. We talk about the, the partnership. Isn't this a good? Opportunity for us, indeed. So Here we have the opportunities. Why can't we take it then? Well, I get, well, you know, we we, will, we I mean, these are decisions that that has to be made in in a different environment. But but if I'm to advise, my advice would be exactly what I say publicly. That we have to partner, and we have to do research and development. We have to build the industry, and we have to take advantage of the the, the value added opportunities in the industry. You know, as you look uh, and uh, we speak, and you wonder if we were, if we were, um, just like, you know, another day on the job and nothing happens. Um, I remember about 12, 15 years ago uh, when they talked about the coming into being of the Caribbean single market and economy. 
and they were speaking about the more develop, developed country there was this fund there was supposed to be a fund where the more developed countries were gonna this fund is gonna be uh, established so that the LDCs you would pump things into the economy to bring them on a path sort of so that you know they can be a level playing field more or less a level playing field and um, 15 years after I mean I'm saying I'm, I'm still saying the, sa saying the same thing nothing has happened so uh, are we serious Trevor to, to, to be honest with you <coughs> Level playing field is a nice term that's used. Well, at least not level, but I mean, uh, a boost. So yes. that at least we can be a little yeah. more competitive. Yeah. More competitive, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the, the reality... It, it makes a lot of sense. The, the, the reality is that international politics basically um, is, is based on, on, on interests. Um, while it might be true that um, MDCs will, will want to help us, LDCs, to move up, it happens only when the interests are not threatened. <laughs> That's reality. Oh, oh. Um, but having said that, we do have a CSME, and it is not a secret that it has not functioned very well. Wait, wait, wait. How would it? The how reality would it is that the single the single economy was originally slated to come into effect in 2008. It has been postponed to 2015. We're not sure if in three years or four years' time. We will have a single economy. Because I'm, not. I'm getting back to the same point. All the, the the plans that were made initially to really move us, you know, it's like uh, an army. You, you move to the pace of the slowest soldier, you know, because there'll, there'll be chaos. So you're moving as a unit. So, you know, it's the, the, the countries that are behind, you got to get them on board so you can trot forward, you know, as one. Yeah, I, I, I get the point. I agree with and that. That has to happen. But but let me, let me, let me just say this. Perhaps as, as a Caribbean people, we have not moved as fast as we should move. Because we who are the ordinary persons, the ordinary people of the region, have not advocated sufficiently. Perhaps we have not held our leaders to account. You see? Perhaps we just sat back and let it be. Maybe if we were a little more militant and we, we, and we were... We, we, we question our leaders and ask them why is it we have done nothing what is the problem and hold them to account then they may have give us, given us explanations but in the absence of that you don't think that's happening I mean the, this had been making I the question, wrongs to, to what extent are we doing news it? over and over you know people, it has been happening I, I wouldn't say so well, uh, I, 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 I let them by our leaders my view is that I don't think all leaders have done enough. And when I say all leaders, I'm not talking about the leader of Grenada. No, no, no. Our Caribbean yes. leaders. That's the reality. Because, <coughs> if, oh, let me tell you something, um, Trevor. Do you know that the Conference of Heads is the highest decision making body in CARICOM? That's a reality. What it means, therefore, that the Conference of Heads, the heads of governments, has ultimate responsibility for the success or the failure of CARICOM. And that, even, that is reality. Even at the last meeting, um, Prime Minister reality. Thomas was, was saying that, you know, many decisions, uh, very important decisions are taken, and they're not, you know, some countries just park them, up, park them up on the side and they're not moving. We cannot yeah. move forward together. Trevor, you know why? Need to be implemented. You know why? It happens simply because CARICOM is a grouping of sovereign states. If a country has not given up an iota of its sovereignty for the good of the regional agenda, then nothing will happen because no, there is no law, there is no CARICOM law, there is no CARICOM regulation, there is nothing CARICOM that obligates any member state to do anything. So therefore, a member state is, is within its own rights to abide by or not abide by anything. That, and uh, there is no law. There is, If you look at the EU, there's no law. the EU has a European Commission. There are European laws. Okay? So there, there's a mechanism that punishes you for failure to comply. CARICOM does not have that. I think the PM was um, <laughs> thinking about that. You know, we we, we, we got to start somewhere so that we can really move forward. You have, you take plans, 
<laughs> you have a meeting and uh, it's not implemented. You take another plan, another meeting, yeah. you take decisions and it's not implemented. And, and uh, you just hold it back. You just hold it back? The, 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 the movement, the forward flow but, of, but of the, of, of, of the region. We, we have to make a clear and, and impassionate analysis of what is in fact the problem. We have to determine exactly what is holding us back and deal with it. You think the, uh, we've seen the uh, appointments of, um, what do you call them, OECS ambassadors, uh, hopefully to, to tackle these kind of issues. You think that would make a difference? What is that the question is whether the OECS ambassadors have teeth. What kind of power do they have? What authority do they have? Can, can a committee of ambassadors make determinations on, 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 on decisions that heads make? Yeah, that's it, yeah. Okay, I guess the Committee of Ambassadors may, may make recommendations to heads, perhaps. They may have some poor view over implementation. But at the end of the day, unless the heads give the com Committee of Ambassadors significant powers, they can't make decisions, per se. Or if they are to make decisions, they, have to, they would only make decisions within a, a particular range of effort right, right. ultimately the so ball is in the court of the heads right certainly as you wrap up now um 2008 um and uh, the formation of the epa um what's next as we move forward uh, on that front from a greener perspective um talked about 72 million euros uh uh, have we started to grab some of that that fund? Well, really well, we 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 have started the process of fully identifying our needs. Here, how it works? Um, it's regional money, eh? and there's already sixteen areas identified by the heads of government for which those monies are going to be spent. 16 areas. Now, there's a broad regional... A couple, couple areas you want to share with us? One, trade facilitation, mm -hmm. services, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, fisheries, fisheries, mm -hmm. um, of course, regional implementation, which is to support regional implementation units. Right. Yeah? Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a couple more, but there are 16 of them. Right, right. Now, what we have to do, what our strategy has to be, is very early to identify what our needs are. When we identify what our needs are, then we have to get those into the regional agenda. Because while we have these broad pieces of money there, the detailed programs are not in yet. Right. That would be subject to negotiation. Okay. So if we have already our program, our project, we have identified our priorities and so forth. We can now be an integral part of the conversation right. and get our agenda in there and have it funded because there's no national money for EPA implementation. And you're saying that we're moving We are moving that. in that direction. Right. Well, the end we have only just started. Right. We have only just so started. So in the next year or two, should we see oh, some certainly. meaningful yes, yes, development? Yes. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, Mr. John it was nice talking to you this morning and certainly um, you have to keep us abreast of what's happening in the AP, EPA and definitely we'll have many more conversations with you as we start to to, to get some benefits man uh, from, from this thing you know right, um, <laughs> 7 30 inside the spice hour we're moving on the spice morning for Tuesday June 21st we take a break and we're speaking there to the um, EPA implementation of uh, coordinator in Grenada and uh, Mr. Desmond John, and you heard about the possibilities, the benefits that can be derived from Grenada's uh, um, partnership with the EPA. Yeah, we really hope that good things will transpire for the Spice House. 7.30 inside the Spice House, we take a break, and we come right back. It's where the action
action is each and every Tuesday evening from 8 p.m. Join sports enthusiasts, those who play, organize, and follow the game as they discuss the issues that matter most in sports. Relive the action of sports and give your views. So let's make a beat. Sports Forum on GIS TV each and every Tuesday from 8 p.m. And then we are going to go, I go in and mind my business. Because since old pandemic dead three years ago, I need a house and land for me. I didn't straighten up my business with government. I ain't paid no tax. But now I had to give you opportunity to fix things by June 30th. I go in, in full speed. And furthermore, a 5% rebate, no speed. I can't afford to gamble your old power work so hard for no way. I go in and pay today. So sit down there and let this golden opportunity pass. Go and pay all the tax quick. Right, it's uh, 28 minutes shy of uh, 8 o'clock as we continue to ride on the Spice Morning for Tuesday, June 21st. I've been joined by uh, Ms. Chanel Andrew, uh, face you've seen all the time on the GIS, um, Inland Revenue Department, uh, PRO. And she's going to tell us about uh, that and public entertainment and also the property tax. You know, I was sort of uh, taking back the first time sometime last year. I went to a football match in the Queen's Park and um, I saw people around and they say, these are the bad people. I'm saying, no. Uh, yeah, they said, yes. <laughs> tell me, oh, good morning to you. Um, good morning. And um, yeah, tell me about the entertainment part of the VAT. How does it work for, for, for that segment of the society? Okay, it's obvious from your reaction you was not too pleased. No, that wasn't too pleased. <laughs> there yeah, you were know. bad there. Now, um, I suspect the football match you went to had some form of entertainment at the well, end. Football mixed with entertainment. Right, right. Yes, yeah, so it's no longer a ordinary sporting activity. Once you have foreign artists performing and all of that, yeah. you have moved away from the sporting event to an entertainment event and that was one of the reasons why you would have noticed that officers there. So anytime present. there is that kind of a uh, well, happening. Public entertainment right. oh. and we are talking about any theatrical, um, comedy show, musical entertainment you would see um, a fat presence there. Now the law exempts sporting activities. So a school having a s normal sporting activity, they would be excluded from the law. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So in a general sense, how has it gone? Um, entertainment and property tax, uh, the, the VAT, how, how are things gone? Okay, in regards to public entertainment, as you know, the carnival season is fast approaching and during the, over the carnival period, we have several shows being performed. Last year, we went off the, a lot of events in general. The law states that there's no threshold for public entertainment. Once you're engaged in a, any form of public entertainment activity, you would be required to register for that. However, administratively, we, would, we have taken a decision to exclude certain activities. If you notice like the Ramona cruise, you would not see um, VAT officers going. So you could, you, could, you could be there? We could be there, okay. but um, for administrative purpose, it could become very tedious if we go after each little dance in the community, <laughs> each little boat ride. <laughs> so certain things we, ex we um, allow, but at the same time, that does not mean they do not pay that. Because for instance, Renwick and Thompson has the rum runner boats and they are registered for that. So they would charge the person's VAT, <coughs> they would pay it on their drinks if they have food, etc. Mm -hmm. So it's not that government is not receiving any income from these activities. Okay, okay. Yes. What about the other, okay, uh, for Carnival coming, um, you've got to pick some of the events that you'll be going to? Well, I won't say pick. Um, I always encourage entertainers and promoters out there, once you're having an event, you come in to us inform us of the activity give us maybe the venue how many persons the cost of your ticket what type of entertainment you are having whether it's foreign artists or just a dj and we would determine whether you should register or not sometimes you may not be required to register for that but you have other tax types like the withholding tax if you are bringing in a foreign artist <coughs> also annual stamp tax because then I, most persons think an entertainment show is a one of something it's not a business but it is a business venture and 
and it, you would be subject to other tax types. So it is your obligation to come in and inform our department of what you have in. And as I would like to urge entertainers out there and promoters, the carnival season is approaching. I know normally everybody want to put on shows, come in as early as possible. The law states that you are required to come in 21 days prior to the event. Some persons tell you just last week uh, I came up with a decision to have that event. Yeah. So I'm urging persons, even if it's one week space, you just decided on it. Um, our office is flexible. You come in, you have a chat with us, and we would proceed. How do you treat events like uh, the Mass Gra, um, Soka Malak? Okay, these events are put on by the Grenada Carnival Committee and they are required to register. Last year we monitored some of the events because it's just a normal entertainment activity and the law does not exclude anybody. Right? So it's when, just when, certain when activities. When something like, like when something like um, Soka Monarch, for example. Yes, last year we had persons monitoring the show, but of course it's government and uh, we have an agreement with them and they clearly understand what is required of them. You think that um, the public uh, has been sensitized enough about uh, the VAT and public entertainment? I would say they have gotten a fair, de a fair level of public education, but at the same time, taxation is a dynamic area, and you could never know enough. Even we as tax officers, we do not know everything. As the day go by, you learn. So um, I wouldn't say they are, well, they are fully aware of their obligations, but I wouldn't say they know everything. There are some things they may still need to contact our office. Right. What about VAT, the VAT on property tax? Not, there's no VAT on property well, tax. It's, it's um, property tax property is tax. a tax type for itself. Right. Um, the deadline for property tax is June 30th, okay. which means that that's just a few days from okay. today. No, this is the deadline for rebate. It's not necessarily the final deadline for payment. The final deadline for payment is August 29th, which is 60 days after June 30th. Persons who pay before June 30th can obtain a 5% rebate on their taxes. That's for the current year. Right. So if you're paying 2010 taxes, you would not be given that 5% rebate because the deadline for 2010 taxes has already gone. So it's 2011 taxes, you get a 5% rebate, and that's if you make payments on or before June 30th. Now, if you do not pay by that time, you have until August 29th, which is 60 days after, to pay your taxes without any interest and penalties. After that um, deadline, August 29th, you would be subject to 10% penalty and 2% interest per month. How has it gone? Uh, people been complying? Uh, people have been, been complying. Coordinating or <laughs> cooperating with you? Yes, people <laughs> have been cooperating with the department. Property tax is a very touchy tax because it affects a wide um, selection of the population. Almost everybody has property tax to pay once you own a house or land. You may not necessarily own the land, but once you have a building, you'd be required to pay property tax for that house. So it's a very touchy tax type and it affects a wide range of Grenadians and persons necessary, um, the law gives us the authority to take back properties, etc. And some persons fear that if they do not pay their taxes, they're going to lose the little they have. You've done that before? Take no, um, the law gives us that authority. <coughs> Our department, is we don't necessarily run after persons and use the harshest measure. Right. We would use other alternatives to try to recover that taxes that are owed. So, um, one in persons, you don't have to necessarily panic. I'm not telling you don't pay your taxes. You would government need the revenue, but um, our department is a friendly department. We work well with taxpayers, and I, we don't use the harshest measure. In a general sense, um, how would you say the whole VAT implementation uh, 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 is, is gone? Uh, goods and services in particular, how is that gone? I would say the implementation has gone very well. As you know, VAT was implemented before in Grenada, and it 
it did not pull through as was planned. Now this is Grenada's second attempt to implement the value added tax and excise tax of course. And well, our office had a lot of administrative changes, policy decisions was made. There was a recent amendment to the Act in April, which the Governor General assented to, and that's the removal of VAT on drumettes, newspapers, um, and some other items. And our office had been able to administer the tax and deal with these administrative changes. Taxpayers have been very compliant. We can boast of compliance level in the 90s. So I would say it have gone very well. And they were thinking that um, <coughs> with the implementation of that, um, maybe six months or a year would have to pass before you see the impact, uh, see certain prices go down as the case might be, are you feeling that kind of effect? Yes, um, as of implementation date, we were telling persons when VAT is implemented, you would see certain hikes in prices and mm -hmm. that is because of the old stock, which right. would already had the general consumption tax embedded in it. And here we was implementing a tax on top of these goods. Now I must say that for most um, businesses, old stock have diminished. So you do, you do not see that hike in price. But of course, it may not be that visible because as you know, prices of goods and services keep increasing every day. So persons may not notice it that significantly. But I would say most business places, old stock has been diminished. It's have been over a year mm -hmm. and almost six months that the value added tax has been implemented. And you're thinking that um, the country is getting used to the the sort of um, the VAT being part of, of, of an everyday life? I think um, <coughs> the population in general have adjusted to the tax very well. Of course, nobody likes to pay tax in general. I sh I'm sure if you have a choice, you would not pay taxes. But we do have our civil duties that we have to fulfill. Mm. Um, a year from now, where do you see the whole venture uh, you think people people are more sensitized and uh, the reaction is better and that the, you know the, the sort of um, support that you need from the public would be had um, oh. well first of all I must say we cannot administer tax successfully without the support from the business community and the general public and we would continue our department would continue to uh, ongoing public education programs. We would also continue to monitor these businesses. Enforcement is important also. Persons have to remember to collect their receipts and demand their receipts when it's not given to them from VAT registered businesses. And it's not only VAT, but all tax types, which include the ASD, the income tax, etc. Our department would continue to educate the population and enforce all the taxes administered. Is there a situation where some people or some businesses by, by nature of the operation do not come under the VAT and yeah. still take that? Um, we uh, have initially that used to happen, but I think how are things going in that area? Okay, because the general population is so educated about VAT, the minute time somebody <laughs> tells you about VAT, you're looking right. for the receipts, <laughs> for the um, certificate, or you want your receipt or something. Right. This is something I must say that most business persons cannot actually get away with telling you they're charging VAT. Persons know they have to get their receipt, they have to see VAT number and all of mm, that. Right. So it's not something, that's why I always say without the general public, we cannot administer the tax for ourselves. Mm -hmm, yes. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that um, a, over a year now it's been implemented, the VAT? A year and six months, February 2010. To so today. far so good? So far so good, but we are still um, I mean, everything would not be perfect. We, it's a still ongoing process, and we it is our division's view to continue to work along with the general public and the business community to successfully administer the tax. And you're still um, assessing, looking to see where you can make things better, sort of alter things here and there to ensure that... We would always do that. Right. Yes. 
for continuing the good work. Thank you. Right. And um, speaking there to the PRO on the Inland Revenue Department, uh, Ministry of Finance, Ms. Chanel Andrew, very regular indeed. She has been here. And like she says, uh, the public has been sensitized. They're getting the, the message. They're understanding about the implementation of that. And certainly that is a victory. Right now it's 15 minutes shy of 8 o'clock. Uh, we take a break and we come right back. It's a spice morning for Tuesday, June the 21st on the GIS. Don't you move the dial. It's hurricane season again. How we got to disaster survival kit ready? Not yet, Mia. What happened? I'll deal with you. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Shut up, Mia. What are you doing? I'm just being a hurricane. A hurricane now? I'm not ready. Play for me, Mia. A hurricane can happen at any time. You must prepare, protect, and assist. Are you ready? Yes, we are ready! Prepare for hurricane. Prepare for hurricane. Make sure you have your radio and your batteries to waterproof flashlight candles. will do thin stuff, garbage bag, first aid kit. Come on, people, make sure you have it. Clean water in a container and a hurricane plan. Hear me, no man. Hurricane damage is beyond your control. Surviving the aftermath is up to you. Have a hurricane plan. It can save your life and your family too. Prepare for hurricane. Your hair prepare for hurricane. <laughs> I want anywhere hurrying to go, I go in and mind my business. Because since old pan dead three years ago, I leave the house and land for me. I didn't straighten up my business with government. I ain't paying no tax. But now I had to gain the opportunity to fix things by June 30th, I go in full speed. And furthermore, a 5% rebate, no speed. I can't afford to gamble with your old power work so hard for no way. I go in and pay today. So sit down there and let this golden opportunity pass. Go and pay all the tax quick. It's all on the GIS. But the carnival swing is on and GIS Channel 12 is staying with the action. Join us Monday and Wednesday evenings from 8 o'clock for the carnival swing, highlighting the major summer festival. It's one hour of the best that you will surely digest on the GIS. Catch it. Right, it's uh, 12 minutes shy of 8 o'clock and I've been joined by Mrs. Alice Roberts, uh, the chief protocol officer in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, Ms. Roxy Hutchinson. She is a foreign service officer and we're going to look at that um, section, the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. Uh, good morning, ladies. Good morning. Looking good morning. really, really sharp this morning. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right. And um, foreign affairs, the role, uh, I think before we were, you came on, we were talking, there's two divisions, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Can, can you tell me about those divisions and uh, what they do? Okay, bef before we talk about the individual divisions, um, we must make it clear that Foreign Affairs is a ministry designed to be the mediator between local government institutions and ministries and uh, other countries, other ministries of Foreign Affairs in other countries and other and international and regional organizations. So you'll find that Foreign Affairs is the organization within Grenada that is expected to liaise with other countries mm -hmm. on behalf of Grenada, whatever happens in Grenada. Good or bad. Good or bad. Right. Yes. And there might be a little um, confusion between Grenada and Trinidad, and uh, you would expect your Ministry of Foreign Affairs to reach across and yes. put things to rest. Certainly, right. certainly. And, um, so, Ms. Hutchinson is in the Policy and Research di um, Division, and I'm in the Protocol Division. So, right. we will talk on the role of our divisions. Let's start with, um, let's see, uh, Policy and Research Division. This is the uh, first time I'm seeing Ms. Ro Roxy Hutchinson, who is used to you. So, I'll give her, I'll give her a bligh here. Very good. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Right. So and tell me about um, your division and uh, what you have been doing in recent times. Okay. The Policy and Research Division is basically the division that is charged with assisting in the formulation of Grenada's foreign policy and to some extent its execution. Um, it's a technical division within the ministry 
and most of the written work that comes from the ministry, um, that division has a lot of input into that. Um, our division practically is subdivided into what we call bilateral relations um, and multilateral relations. And by bilateral relations, we mean Grenada's relationships with other countries. Um, so for example, Grenada's relationship with Cuba, Grenada's relationship with the USA, with Britain. Um, under multilateral, we deal more with organizations, how Grenada relates to the UN and the OAS, um, the ACP, the EU, those organizations. And um, so <coughs> what we actually do is we're responsible for providing briefs for senior government officials, for prime minister, the ministers, um, when they're attending meetings abroad, right, right, right. Um, up-to-date information on the issues at hand, um, topics to look out for, um, assisting in formulating Grenada's position, and that is done most times in consultation with our missions abroad, who are actually on the ground in the countries and, and feed us information. So it's a constant dialogue that goes through the missions, through the research and policy and research division, and all the way up to the political directorate. Mm -hmm. um, also, we do diplomatic notes, third person correspondence, you know, conveying messages to um, and from other countries. We do condolence messages. For example, there is a flood in Brazil. Um, the government of Grenada is expected to respond because we have relationships with Brazil. Um, the foreign service officers within that ministry designated for Brazil would go ahead and draft a message um, subject to approval from the PS and the, the minister, the prime minister, if the need be, before it's going out. Um, Independence Day of Honor for our traditional partners, our allies in general, is coming up. Or some historic achievement, um, a congratulatory message is drafted and sent to that country. So these are some of the things that, that, that we do um, in the bilateral division. Uh, we're also responsible for following technical cooperation leads. Um, we do country profiles on the countries. Um, for example, an ambassador is presenting credential. Now, uh, Mr. Roberts will tell you some more about that because it's directly related to protocol as well. But we would look at the country at hand. Um, let's take, for example, Morocco, which is a country we've been engaging quite a lot lately. The Moroccan ambassador is coming to present credentials. The foreign service officers in that, re in that department would look at Morocco in general. What is this country? Uh, do we have any common interest with this country? What are their strengths? What is their policy on technical cooperation? Uh, which organizations are they a part of that we are looking at um, having representation in or seeking assistance from? So we look at the country, the strengths, the weaknesses, and we see how we can, as a country, benefit from engagement with that country. And so we provide this information to the ministers, the PM, so that they, they have an idea as to what we're engaging. We also look at the person who is presenting. What sort of person is that? Is that a career diplomat? Is he a political appointee? Right. You know, what's his background? So you know <coughs> at what level to start the engagement. Um, so that, that's, that's something we do. At a different level, we also work along with project officers in the Ministry of Finance if, um, when it comes to writing projects. So we feed them information as to the country that is being requested the assistance from. And um, they help us in the development of the project so that we can present a proposal to that particular country. Um, also, in more on the multilateral aspect, we look at Grenada's relationship with other organizations. And um, we have an officer who follows multilateral issues. So the UN General Assembly is coming up, the OAS General Assembly, the ACP meetings, EU meetings in Brussels. Work closely with our missions abroad where we have them. Um, in an effort to arrive at positions for, for Grenada. Um, how do we negotiate? The, what is the status of it? Should we form alliances with countries to help push our agenda? You know, which countries are friendly towards us? Which countries are a bit hostile towards us? So all of that information has to be researched. And as our name says, policy and research, we do research, we do analysis. And, and as you know, international dynamics is constantly changing, so we're forever updating what we may write today may not be valid tomorrow, tomorrow because of yes. something that have happened. So we have to be constantly on top of international events as they occur and make sure that our political directorate is brought up to speed in that Seems regard. Seems to be a very big undertaking. Um, I'm, I'm thinking too, it's a, a big staff too. 
Oh no, we're quite <laughs> small, but we, we call ourselves magicians mm -hmm. because we um, the, the workload that we cover for a very small staff, um, I think it has to do a lot with that the officers have a passion for, for foreign affairs and the work that they do. We also have um, very qualified persons in, in international relations and we have people that we can call on with expertise having qualifications and years of service like Ms. Roberts herself who worked in policy and research and headed the division at one time and um, so we we have a good camaraderie you know and that helps pull us through um, despite our acute staff shortages. Right and Ms. Roberts um how large, uh, how small is that staff? <laughs> uh, as in protocol staff? Everything, or? everything. Okay, in protocol and research division. Wow, probably about, <coughs> about 10. Okay, that's about 10, 9, that's 10. Not yes, 9, now 10. Tell me about pro the protocol side of it now. Well, we have to work uh, um, in collaboration with the policy and research division. Uh, Roxy mentioned that uh, when an ambassador is coming, they have to write briefs. If an ambassador has to come to Grenada, first protocol needs to do a submission to cabinet, get the permission of cabinet. Once we get that permission, then we will write the country a diplomatic note and say, yes, your, your ambassador has been approved for appointment in Grenada. Then when they tell us they're coming on a certain date to present their credentials, we will prepare a program of activities because by the Vienna Convention, we are mandated to ensure that while the um, visitor is in Grenada, we are responsible for their safety. Right, right. We ensure that uh, there's security at the airport, there's um, security um, outriders. Uh, we make sure that we meet them on arrival. We are with them throughout their stay and even all their activities, we are there. The security is also there with them. So that is our role. Also, um, we work. <coughs> sorry, we work also with delegations coming for conferences and meetings. Again, we do. We hear a lot about meet and greet, but that is not the main function of foreign affairs. We also ensure that. Uh, if the visitor has to get a visa on arrival, meaning permission to enter Grenada, that we request that visa from immigration. We ensure that they send us all their biodata information on their passport details, etc. So they would send that information to us. We would go ahead and request that inform um, the visa from um, immigration. And on the other hand, if our visitors, our nationals, our government officials require visas to enter another country. That's our role mm -hmm. too. Right. We would write the other country, send all their information, the purpose of their visit, and uh, the length of stay, etc. And we will request the visa so that when they are, many times we would have to send the passports and get it back, etc. Um, the protocol division is really responsible and mandated by the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations 1961 to ensure that uh, di diplomats who are resident in our country are well taken care of and that they are not um, encumbered in any way by taxes or by any other problems they may meet along the way. So we would provide them with an identification card uh, and uh, we would ensure that uh, if they need a, a vehicle, they would get that vehicle, duty-free concessions, because we need to remember that one sovereign country does not pay um, taxes right. to another. Right. Um, we also handle um, <coughs> consular officers uh, who are not diplomats, but in order to facilitate their work, we ensure that they have the privileges, which may be limited, and immunities uh, that they are entitled to. So we are constantly liaising with other ministries to ensure that those ministries know that these persons are entitled to um, certain concessions, etc. Um, in terms of, we mentioned um, credentials, foreign affairs, we pre protocol actually prepare credentials for our diplomats to go to other countries. All right, so we're not just receiving, we're also preparing for our diplomats. Huh? It means we need to request the permission again. All right. Because you're taking care of your own. Yes, <laughs> of we also take care of our own. 
and you know if there is some assistance they would need on the other end officially we are the ones to write to that country uh, even when our government officials ministers and other official public officers need to travel abroad to attend a meeting international meetings like the UN and the OAS, EU, they need, um, they require credentials to, for the um, delegates to attend the meeting. We prepare those as well. Um, <coughs> All right, well. Right, and um, for my um, involvement in the media, mm -hmm. I, I, I must say that I see the Ministry of Foreign Affairs very much alive, very much alive. We can feel you, I can touch you during um, independent celebrations. Well, <laughs> that <laughs> is <laughs> true. Why is this? That, so? is, that is true. <laughs> but I don't think um, our involvement is limited to just celebrations as these. Um, foreign Affairs is a ministry that it is very difficult sometimes to see the fruit that comes from the, end, the, you know, the hard work that comes from foreign affairs. Um, I often say that in most cases, if you need to see what foreign affairs does, you have to also look at other ministries. So mm -hmm. you may see um, the Ministry of Agriculture receiving some equipment from China, or, or you may see the Ministry of Sports receiving some assistance, or you may see you know, assistance coming in different packages 90% mm -hmm. of the time. It starts in foreign affairs. It starts with the, the, the negotiations at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. What foreign affairs does is after the negotiations are well underway or sometimes complete, we hand over to the line ministries in this regard. Right. So you, you would not look around foreign affairs and see, oh, this is what foreign affairs has to show. But you can look at the overall picture, the whole aspect of the cooperation that comes into the country as a whole mm -hmm. to be able to see the foreign affairs involvement. Right. So while you may see us um, at celebrations as independents, as Mr. Roberts said, um, most of the times that they're represented by um, our diplomatic corps is there. And because our ministry is instrumental in making sure that, that they are looked after properly, you would see foreign affairs at the forefront in, in you know, meetings and celebrations as these but foreign affairs goes a lot but Robert, do you in any way come up with, with plans or programs or ventures that you might want to see um you know happen in the country and uh, you would be the one to initiate okay well i'm not sure what programs you might be referring From to a development, but developmental um, perspective well, anything. The, the policy and research division would liaise with other ministries because they're the ones who are looking at uh, local okay. aspects okay. Uh, okay. and based on what uh, um, projects they're working on, um, foreign, af foreign affairs, as in the policy and research division, could go out there and uh, look for the opportunities for support for those projects. Uh, but and in you terms of. You have been from time to time mm -hmm. been placed in that situation well yeah. m most regularly mm -hmm. yeah, right. yes yeah. that's where the um, the policy and research division look for the opportunities uh, they look to see what uh, could be done where development could start in different areas yeah. and um, policy and research would go out quite a lot uh, quite a lot mm -hmm. you're doing I but I need to mention regarding independence you see us in those events yeah. is because uh, protocol uh, is uh, sitting on the committees, the organizing committees, to guide and direct those committees. Right. Yes, we also offer courtesies. We talk we hear about protocol courtesies a lot. It is not just for um, making some people more look more important than others, but basically because of um, who they represent, our government officials, and uh, yes, the officials of other countries. Uh, because we're supposed to ensure that their work is facilitated, uh, we make sure we meet and greet them and uh, we place them in certain, you know, pr front row seats right, and uh, so forth. Another, um, not to cut you, but another key function um, that I think um, the public needs to be aware of is that um, foreign affairs is a diplomatic arm of the government. And one of the key elements of diplomacy is reciprocity. So if we're not careful in how we take care right. of the diplomats who are here, 
we don't want to have that same treatment right. reciprocated to us abroad. Mm -hmm. And um, at the same time, we need to be aware also that we hear a lot about foreign affairs being about travel mm -hmm. and about being dressing nicely mm -hmm. and having cocktails. Um, a lot of the times, that's what you see on the surface. But what happens underneath is negotiations for develop economic developmental projects for the country. So despite the, what is on the outlook, a lot of times because maybe we don't have enough opportunities to, to blow the trumpets of foreign mm -hmm. affairs that we're, we've been seen in that line. But um, foreign affairs, like um, unlike most ministries, work around the clock. Well, I, I would like to add yeah. to that that um, the, the the receptions and the dinners come after a long mm -hmm. hard day of continuous work. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that day, a reception is called for an ambassador who's going back or for mm -hmm. delegates, a welcome reception. And we are there because, uh, yes, we, in terms of PNR, have to um, have develop and build friendly relations mm -hmm. with the representatives of the other country. And of course, protocol is there because we need to ensure that the diplomat is treated um, correctly. But uh, very often, it is at the end of a long, hard day and retired. So it's like <laughs> additional work. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Roberts, before you all run out, um, tell me about the protocol as it concerns officials. Um, protocol for uh, the prime minister, for the GG, for a foreign diplomat. Uh, I know certain do's and don'ts are, <laughs> are in order. OK. Um, <coughs> I'm not sure exactly protocol in what aspect. Th there's, certain, uh, there's certain courtesies or certain mm -hmm. actions that are taken for the GG, for example. Okay, or for arriving for uh, late yes, last yes, uh, at, a, uh, at a function. The journalist or the, the, uh, the ordinary man on the street needs to, to know about. Okay. Um, you know, one thing that comes to my mind immediately is the fact that uh, the ordinary man on the street, when we meet those persons at functions, um, we should not uh, rush to them and try to squeeze in an interview or try to get a telephone number, or, you know. That's, that is not the place and the time. We need to ensure, that's why the Prime Minister would have security around him as well as, you know, the Governor General, because uh, if, uh, because they are in a certain position, persons would think of rushing to them and asking them favors and various questions, etc. And they need to be respected for the position that they hold. Uh, if the Prime Minister or the Governor General is uh, attending a function, then protocol must know. We should be told in advance and we would make arrangements to be there. We will meet them on arrival at function, and it is hoped that they are told that they should come just before the, the function begins. When they arrive, the function should begin, because right. you don't keep your most important person waiting. Yeah. So the function begins, and if it's a reception or so, there should be persons to serve them. We should not uh, allow them to go <coughs> in line, except we guide them or lead them to the buffet table first if uh, the caterer is not serving. You know, we ensure that uh, they are first in line. It's not as if they're waiting, standing with a plate in line. And at the end of that function, we will walk them back mm -hmm. out and escort them to their vehicle. So um, I'm saying that uh, if uh, a journalist or someone wants to have an interview or they need to get your permission. I think so. I would say so. Okay, so yes. you, you Instead of just rushing to them. Right, you don't normally run them away. Yeah. No, we don't. <laughs> we right. don't. We try it's to make it. It's a matter of coordinating. And yes, it's a matter of coordinating. Quite a lot. Quite a lot. Um, well, we never haven't said everything. No. But um, the <laughs> well, time is short, time, so yeah, we're yeah, trying yeah, to see yeah, how yeah, much we can get. I never knew that uh, so much happened in the... Like I said, uh, I, you were very much uh, prominent during independence, uh, like I'm saying, you know, I know you're there, but like you tell you, you do so much, so many other things, mm -hmm. so much other things, and um, I think we've learned a lot this morning about the, the work of the, the Ministry of um, Policy and Research Division and the Protocol Ministry of um, Foreign Affairs. I thank you so much for being sharing your time with us, and uh, certainly uh, we can come back sometime to continue on another topic. Uh, Thank you another endeavor that you undertake 
in the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. Thank you so much. I'm speaking there to uh, Mrs. Alice Roberts, the Chief Protocol Officer, and of course the uh, Ms. R Ms. Rapsi Hutchinson, the Foreign Service Officer. And you heard about the work of um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Two departments working very hard to ensure that this country continues to grow and develop. Ten minutes gone past the hour. We take a break and we come right back. Don't you move the dial. It's the J.S. Spice Morning. Come see and get to know Thanks. our Grenadian agro-processors on June 22nd as they showcase healthy alternatives. A wide display of a variety of lovely tasting locally produced products. It takes place at the National Stadium from 11 in the morning and continues throughout the day. Healthy foods are for you and me and they are produced right here by our Grenadian people. The opportunity is yours to meet the producers and make arrangements for your supply of healthy alternatives on Wednesday, June 22nd at the National Stadium. This event is organized by the Grenada Dehydrated Fruits and Vegetable Clusters. For more information, contact the Bureau of Standards at 440-5886. The house was shaking, shaking, then said the story here, babe, crack, 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 and the roof had gone. Man, I was so scared, I nearly wet myself. Only those who have lived it can truly understand the devastating fury of a hurricane's wind. The house across the road just get up and roll over. Hurricane force wind, it's a hazard. Hazards. Take control. Reduce your loss. You can hurricane proof your home. For example, Make your roof more wind resistant by using screws instead of nails in its construction. Find out more about hurricane force winds and other hazards at your local disaster office. A message from your national disaster office and Sidera. As a responsible mother, I would not be caught off guard for this hurricane season. Mr. Ivan and Miss Emily taught my family and I a serious lesson. Them long lines in the burning hot sun, asking for handouts, not me again, not me again. So I am shopping very early for the supplies my family needs for this active season. Join with me and do the same. I remember when this beach was really wide, a place to picnic and play cricket. Mm, and we used to go up to the end to get away from all the people. Now all the beach gone. Coastal erosion. When the sea starts to come in and take the land away, everyone loses something. Granny, the all the waves are washing right under that hole. Coastal erosion. It's a hazard. Hazards. Take control. Reduce your loss. What can you do to help stop coastal erosion? For one, don't drive four-wheel vehicles on seaside dunes. They loosen sand and destroy binding vegetation, causing erosion. Find out more about coastal erosion and other hazards at your local disaster office. A message from your national disaster office and Sidera. Right, and we're now to the final segment of our program for today. Uh, Tuesday the 21st, I've been joined by three health officials, uh, Mr. Clement uh, Gabriel, he is the acting permanent secretary in that uh, ministry, uh, Mr. Francis Balwant, uh, senior environmental officer, and of course, uh, Nurse Lydia Francis, is the chief community health nurse. And we're looking at, uh, we're highlighting various issues of work within the Ministry of Health. And uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, officials, and uh, where are we going to start? Maybe we're going to start from the top. Start with Mr. Gabriel. What can you tell us? Uh, uh, about um, the ministry, the whole operation, how it's planned and how things are, <coughs> how things take place. Okay, <laughs> for better okay. Word. thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. <coughs> um, I want to say that the, the Ministry of Health is divided into three major functional areas. And these areas are administration, hospital services and community services. We commit ourselves to the, the primary health care approach. And uh, as we say, we are putting health first. Mm -hmm. The ministry has a mission or a vision before the mission. The vision is an, 
and improved health status and quality of life for all citizens of the nation, ensuring that individuals, families, and communities attain the highest state of optimum wellness. And in trying to achieve that, that vision, we establish a mission that is the mandate for which the ministry exists to promote and provide health services that are appropriate, accessible, equitable, and sustainable by utilizing suitably qualified and motivated staff committed to excellence and professionalism. Right. And uh, Mr. Balwan, so what role are you playing as a senior envi environmental officer? How does your work tie into the whole fear of, um, you know, ensuring that uh, adequate health services is provided okay. for nationals? Well, the, I represent the Environmental Health Department, which is an integral part of the whole delivery of health services within the state of Grenada. Well, our focus mainly is on the whole question of preventive health. So, environmental health focuses on actually the reduction of what you call communicable diseases. And we are one of the department, well, I will say not only within the Ministry of Health, but we are one of the departments within the entire public service that actually have to deal with the more, what you call, intra and intersectorial collaboration. We have to actually, on a daily basis, collaborate with a lot of what you call agencies within the environment, within the Ministry of Health and outside in the delivery of, our, of, of the public service or the public health services that we provide on a daily basis. Right, and uh, Nurse Lydia Francis, uh, you want to tell us about your involvement and um, how do you um, coordinate and um, interact with these two gentlemen to ensure that you know, we get the best? Okay then, um, thank you. Um, first let me state the Community Nursing Division, which is a component of the Community Health Services. That is where um, we provide primary health care services. And our main focus is to promote, provide promotive, preventative, rehabilitative, and curative care to the whole population, the state of Grenada, Cairo, and PT Martinic. And we provide these services through approximately 36 health facilities, which is strategically based throughout Great Grenada, Cairo, and PT Martinic. And these services, we have um, a cadre of trained. Um, nurses or nursing staff and we collaborate with all other departments to ensure we arrive at the mission and vision. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Gabriel, uh, as the man on top, you have had to, you know, bring pull them in at times, uh, uh, they may be slacking sometimes and you say, <laughs> bad ones, um, you know, come on. A bit of something here and there, ensure that uh, you're on top of, 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 of things, ensuring that the work, um, your, your mandate is... is okay, um, <coughs> that's true. Um, well, from an administrative point of view, the, as I said, the ministry functions in three areas, and from the administration level, the administration is there to um, establish and formulate policies um, do planning, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. And within those, within those ambits, we are able to get everybody together. Um, as regards the formulation of policies, we have uh, regulations or legislations and regulations in place so that the, the environmental health officers will ensure that these um, regulations are being adhered to out there in public to ensure that our environment is clean and conducive to good health. Um, we also have legislation for the to ensure that our young people, children in particular, have their immunization. As you know, this is a prerequisite for entering school. And um, so, you know, we have to collaborate with 
all the stakeholders within the ministry and not only um, well within the community we have the other the other allied health professionals the pharmacists the the um, the dentists we have the the district medical officers who provide those um, health services in the district along with our public health nurses and so on so is community health strong you mentioned um, uh, 36 uh, health services um, around the country, country um, 36 right yes. um, is it strong and can one rely on on mm. the kind of services um, you can go to your district before taking the journey to the hospital most definitely this is a preventative preventative care we offer outside and all the health facilities provide um, family health which comprise of antenatal care that's attend to the pregnant woman postnatal mothers who after the babies born and um, we have child health where we provide immunization look at the growth and development of our children we have um, family planning where we advise and counsel mothers on the importance of spacing their children so that you know they wouldn't be frustrated with too many children because we know economically how things are we provide services like wound management home care you know visit at persons at home we have a number of specialized clinic at our health facilities uh, especially the health centers where we have mental health clinic dermatology which is a um, management of skin problems we have the pediatric clinic that is looking at special problems with our children and we have neonatology clinic which is also care of the newborn so we have a number of care and our healthcare outside the community nursing is critical. I always look at it as a backbone of health, and it is it prov we provide a wide range of services. And we know that the population um, visit the health facilities to obtain their care. Right, and Mr. Balwantong, um, give me a little feel as yes. to environmental health okay. and the sort of work yeah. that um, pertains there. Right. Well, to be specific. Um, we, we have a number of what you call priority areas that falls under our jurisdiction. And we, we, whereas we are what you call health educators in one sense, we are also law enforcement officers too. Because we, as Mr. Gabriel said, we have a number of actual legal uh, regulations that we, that we have to actually follow. Our, our main focus area is, for example, in the area of food safety, vector control, the whole question of water quality monitoring, the question, well, when we say general sanitation, ensuring that the whole question of proper excreta disposal in the communities in general, um, the maintenance of public facility, like public toilets and bathrooms, uh, the maintenance of uh, public cemeteries, and so on. The question of um, ensuring that the adequate amount of uh, so resources, human resources, is, 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 is adequately there so as to, to, to have the daily function and so on. So all, that's why I said we are, we have a, it's a very diverse we, we In order for us to achieve that, we cannot actually do it all by ourselves. We have to collaborate and a lot of people oh, they don't understand how wide environment the, the field of environmental health is right as to to say how we how we do it we out in the district just like the community nursing we have environmental health officers and environmental health offices in every parish and every parish is actually um, let me say is staffed with a district environmental health officer I mean Right about now, we have some deficiencies, but we don't really want to, to go to talk about some of our deficiencies, like in our staffing and so on, that cause us maybe not to really w um, give us 100% of max, and the administrator might may, mm -hmm. may be able to speak much about that. We know the, our constraints <coughs> and so on. So, but in a nutshell, this is some of the things, and our main, as I said earlier, our main focus is to prevent and, re and reduce the incident of of communicable diseases. Right, and there will always be constraints, Mr. Gabriel, and um, as you 
look at uh, the services you've been providing to the country in recent times, um, what would you say it is like uh, 65 percent, 70 percent in terms of uh, the sort of standard and levels that people look forward to in the 21st century, adequate um, health services. Uh, are you really hitting that mark? Well, I would say that we we are about 75 percent because um, you know to build. we we we're building. Right. You know, um, there's always room for improvement. But um, our priority areas, we have some health priority areas like prevention, early detection, treatment of chronic non-communicable diseases like cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, uh, the management of communicable diseases like HIV, AIDS, dengue, and foodborne diseases and so on, um, uh, disaster mitigation or disaster management, mental health and substance abuse, obesity, nutrition, uh, promotion of healthy lifestyles in the population, environmental protection, and the health system development. So all these areas are, these are the, the areas that we focus on in order to ensure that we provide health for the nation. And the, the strategies that we, that, we, um, uh, that we employ here is, one is the reorganization of the primary health care services. And the, the, first of all, the, before that, we we'll say the restructuring of the management of the Ministry of Health. Um, we also looking at um, human resource development, as mentioned by Mr. Balwant. Um, we have some deficiencies in terms of human resource. But as you might be aware, um, there is a, a health human, um, a human resource needs assessment right. is being done right now throughout the Ministry of Health. And it is expected that the, the results of this assessment will be uh, sent to the Ministry of Health with recommendations so that we can determine what our gaps are and what our needs are so that we can continue to plan for the future. Yeah. What about um, um, how do you plan for the future? New services uh, come into being. There was talk about um, possibly the movement of the hospital to another area. What can you tell me about those, those things? Okay. Well, um, as regards new services, um, well, following the human resource audit, there will definitely, we are quite certain that there will be some some changes within the, the human resource structure in terms of ensuring that we have the right people in the right place at the right time. Uh, we are going to, we are in the, in the process now of um, introducing a national health insurance. In fact, work is being done by a special committee to look at the possibility of us establishing a national health insurance so as to, to um, in, uh, enhance the health financing situation in our country. How would that work? Big bad. How would it do? How would it work? Well, we we haven't we haven't um, gone into the details, uh, but there is a committee that is now looking at the possibility. So it's not it's not established. It's not yet you know in train, but we are making all the necessary moves to get some consultancy to yeah. work with us along that line. Um, as regards the, the hospital, at the moment we are in discussions with the, Ven with the Venezuelans to complete the second phase of the hospital. There are some, some challenges with that, but um, um, in the not too distant future, there will be some, the, some movements in, in that area. And uh, while we are looking towards completing the second phase, we are also looking at correcting some of the deficiencies in the current um, facilities. Uh, res as regards the teaching hospital, uh, negotiations are now on the way with the St. George's University as their intention is to establish a clinical teaching program in Grenada and uh, to to achieve that, the possibility of the construction of a teaching hospital is also in the making. Right. But so this is this is in, in, in progress at the moment. Right, and um, 
nurse uh, Edgar, final word from you. Yes, Francis. Francis, sorry. <laughs> okay, well, I want to first um, briefly discuss about the National Infectious Disease Control Unit, which um, manages or conducts voluntary counseling and testing for HIV clients. Um, their main purpose is to provide voluntary counseling and testing for HIV, prevention, management, and treatment of HIV. And um, we have a collaborative effort, as for example, in our antenatal care, we, pro we um, do pro program for mother-to-child transmission, where we test each mother for HIV, and we had 100% no transmission of HIV with to babies, as was earlier yeah. stated. Yeah. So I just want to discuss that. But I also want to say that um, we also, in our health, in our community nursing division, chronic disease program, which is managed mainly by the family nurse practitioner and some of the district medical officers. This is a critical area because, as we have seen, there's a growing population in um, that with diabetes and high blood pressure, hypertension, because. And we want to curb that problem because it's really a great problem for our country. But then finally, I would like to say that the community nursing division, our staff is quite committed and we're ready to continue to provide primary health care services to the population. And as was stated, we all have challenges, but we have to um, try together to see how we can override these challenges. You're going to fight on. The challenges wouldn't slow you down. <laughs> if I slow you down, you know, it wouldn't stop you. <laughs> right, um, Mr. Baro, Baro, you um, the final yeah, word. Yeah, just final word is that just to reiterate a point where where we um, is committed to actually eliminate and actually reduce the incidence of communicable diseases. One of the challenges we face is the re-emerging of new communicable diseases. For example, the, the H1N1. You hear about the, you know, in recently you heard about a new strain of the E. coli uh, that, that, is a, that is a food, a food bone um, that creates food, food bone illnesses and so on. So whereas, yes, we, we, we there, as a matter of fact, I, I always say that in environment health, we, I think we have done our job well over the years that we, we was able to keep communicable disease under control in Grenada and what you will find that there has been a chain you know, from com communicable diseases to non-communicable disease because you see the main causes of death in, in Grenada now is not the, the directly with communicable disease is the cancers, is the, the diabetes and so on. So while we, 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 we control in one area there are other area um, has developed and now we have in the internationally new and emerging diseases coming up. So that is one of the challenges that the environmental health department will have to be faced to, to be prepared for the new and emerging diseases that we have to face. And I know that um, you fueled, uh, you, you've, gi you've given the inspiration to work yes. when, you, when you challenge. Yes. All right. <laughs> All right. I'm speaking there to, uh, you heard about the work of the Ministry of Health, um, speaking to three of the officials, the acting permanent secretary, Mr. Clement Gabriel, Francis Balwant, who is a senior environmental officer, and of course, uh, Nurse Lydia Francis, the chief community health nurse. Very, very important indeed, the work of the Ministry of Health to ensure that Grenada stays healthy and fit. A final word? Yes, um, I just want to say that um, our major challenge at this time is with the primary health care, and we are trying to, we are trying to refocus and uh, uh, revitalize the primary health care team so that uh, the communities can be better served and we have more you know health promotion health facilities at the moment we have we are refurbishing most of our health facilities out there to provide that kind of service and one of the services that we trying to introduce in addition to the revitalizing is to expand the extend the hours eight to four in some areas and we want to introduce what we call a men's clinic because we recognize that men often go to the doctor when they're you know in the last stage of the illness or when they find out that they cannot they cannot go anymore yes. you know because they always said that they always say that they don't have the time the time that it, the services are provided they have to go to work and that kind of thing so we try to ensure that we cover everybody within the, 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 health, the health field. But um, one last thing I want to say 
with regards to this week, um, the, some of the activities that HELD has for this week. Uh, this afternoon, we have the volunteer counseling and testing. That's at the ministerial complex. Um, well, we're having a health fair too. The health fair begins at 1 o'clock, and in that health fair, we'll have the voluntary counseling and testing. On the 27th, we have the regional testing day. That's um, sponsored by PANCAP, the uh, Pan-Caribbean Health, and the Scotia Bank. That's an initiative in collaboration with the Ministry of Health in the Caribbean. And we have testing in three sites on that day, the 27th June, in Grenville, Saint, in Grenville at the car park, St. George's and Bruce Street, Grandans on the Scotia Bank premises, and on Fisherman's Bud Day, uh, June 29th, we have VCT at Guelph, and in July, a date to be announced in Caracol. Right, you heard there from Mr. Clement Gabriel, the Acting Permanent Secretary, and uh, you heard about the work of the Ministry of Health. Very, very enlightening indeed. Well, here's where we're going to lower the curtains on proceedings for today. It has been another enlightening program, as only the GIS can do. I am Trevor Thwaites on behalf of uh, Chadlin, uh, Akir, Ms. Murray, and all of the rest of the staff who made it possible signing out and uh, inviting you to come back again tomorrow morning, God's willing, at the same time, 7 o'clock, for another Spice Morning for Wednesday. Until, have yourselves a wonderful day. Watching the Government Information Service, channels 12 and 22.